and welcome everybody to the YouTube Guitar Q&A live stream. I just like calling it that, the YouTube Guitar Q&A live stream. How long do you think I can get away with that? Just naming what we do here as like, as if it's the only thing on YouTube. My name is Jonathan and I know who you are. Stephen, Live to Fly, Scott, Ray, welcome. John, welcome. Hey, you guys. Uh, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to rock and roll. We had a uh, a week. I hope you had a week. And I'm um, so much to do today. Okay, so first thing, beginner guitar lessons. Thank you for being here. He is our moderator. Um, uh, let's get some questions coming in. Put a few question marks in advance. I am here, number one, to answer your questions to the best of my ability or to direct you to a resource where the answers may lay, um, may lie, may lie. Uh, lots to talk about, though. Uh, I have a poll question that I can't wait to see how you guys react to. I have um, uh, it's an opportunity for you guys to make some requests because I'm starting to put together my next um, book and I, I want to take requests seriously. So um, stay tuned for that. We have a guitar play along song tonight and the guitar play along uh, corresponds with um, the chord family of the week um, as suggested by Stephen Mannion way back in the day. So we have a chord family to, to discuss and play and a song that uses that chord family. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about down up picking as applied to scales. Um, no big deal, but just an idea I had um, with one of my students a few days ago. As you guys know, I teach lessons Monday through Saturday and Saturday night, you guys uh, get all the things that percolate in my mind Monday through Saturday. Had nine, nine students today and um, nine very different people, very awesome people. Oh, uh, here's something to, uh, to, to share with you guys. What would you do if you were me? Okay, I have a great student who is, let's say she's six or seven. When she plays the guitar in a conventional way, She's not quite pushing her finger down quite hard enough. She doesn't always use the extreme tip of her finger. She sometimes uses the pad. And uh, sometimes her thumb, check out my thumb here. Sometimes her thumb comes around like the front of the guitar, you know. And so, you know, I keep correcting her, you know, and, and trying to be gentle, you know, because the goal here is to, to uh, create a lifelong guitar player, right? Okay, bottom line is, because of what she's doing, she often gets these dead muffled sounds, right? And we all know, I mean, she knows that's not what we wanna do. Now, check this out. As she plays, her guitar kind of slides down horizontally into her lap, little by little. And her thumb continues to come around, you know, out in front of the guitar. As she does these two things, her sound actually improves, you know? She sounds better like that. When I correct her, and I get the guitar back up, let's call this vertical. And I, I strongly encourage her to use, to keep her thumb around the back. She starts getting those sounds again. What do I do? I, I know I'm asking you, right? I should put a couple question marks in advance of this question. What do I do? When her technique improves, her sound suffers, which I know makes no sense. But believe me, that I, this that's why I'm asking you guys. When her technique disintegrates, <laughs> her sound improves. It's tricky, you know? And I remind her a bunch of times, yeah, let's hold the guitar like this, you know? Let's keep that thumb around the back of the neck. And she does it for three minutes. What, no, not even, who am I kidding? She does it for 10 seconds, yeah. Ah, so I'm taking it easy because like I said, my goal with any, any student is to, uh, you know, help create and maintain a positive experience that um, hopefully results in someone who is a lifelong music player, right? And, uh, but I, I've never had anyone who so consistently, you know, blows my mind. Anyways, what would you guys do? Should I be, make a big deal about it and say like, no, you cannot play the guitar that way. You can't do those bad habits. Or should I, you know, gently correct her? I don't know, this is what's on my mind. You know, so she was one of my students today. Great kid. She's going to do great. Mm. But like, I've never had that exact experience before. I've taught for decades, my friends, decades. Uh, that's what's on my mind. Um, 
Okay, time surfing alien, TSA. Hello, Chaz. Hello, Walter. Hello, Nick from Georgia. Hey, you guys. Uh, so let's get into our poll question. And I was thinking about how to phrase this poll question, but I want to jump in. We got 25 of you here already. Excellent. So here's the here's the poll question. Um, okay. Is your goal to be a strummer? And I'll clear. Don't worry. I'll, I'll uh, explain. Or. Uh, or a total pro. Now, what does that mean? Okay, is your goal to be a strummer or total pro? And I'll tell you where I fall, and the answer might surprise you. Okay, start the poll now. You guys are welcome to, I, I encourage you to talk about this in the chat, but the poll is live. Okay, so what does that mean? Strummer, think sitting around the campfire, the kind of person who knows 10, 20, maybe dozens of songs, and you strum your way through them, people can sing along, life is good. I mean, that is pretty cool. Who wouldn't want to be in that situation, right? You know, you're a strummer. You know a bunch of lyrics, a bunch of uh, chord changes, you know, a bunch of tunes. You're not pushing yourself to play every subtlety that the person recorded, the recorded version has, right? Um, but you're, you're banging out these tunes, people are singing along, a drummer can join in, life is good. Or are you more inclined to invest a ton of time in playing a tune as accurately as possible to get that one tune, mm, you know, you know, getting it exactly or as close as humanly possible, as close as you can get it to the actual recording. So I'm calling that a total pro. No judgment. Both things are good. I'm curious where you guys are at. Yes, I get that. We all want to be great guitar players. But I know there's some of you out there, I'm just wondering how many are totally fine banging out chords and playing rhythm guitar and either you sing or someone else singing, and, and that, that's, that's where your head is at. And I'm sure there's a certain percentage out there who, like your attitude is, look, I'm gonna take my favorite songs and I'm gonna play them as accurately as possible. And if that's, you know, one song every two months, it's worth it because I'm mm, I'm playing that song. You're not trying to get everyone together on the campfire and entertain them for two hours. You know, you're you're taking that satisfaction in, you know, in nailing the tune the way it's recorded. So where do you guys fall? Who amongst you are strummers or aiming to be strummers? And that is mm, and who amongst you you want to be a total pro and just nail it, even if even if that um <clears throat> limits your repertoire, right? Maybe you're good at you get good at six songs a year or two songs a year or whatever, but you're so good at those songs. All right, so I look forward to, to seeing what you guys what you guys say. Uh, looking in the chat, <clears throat> um, uh, Scott Rhodes. Wow, Scott Rhodes got himself a Gretsch baritone guitar. You know, number one, can I just say, Scott, that I'm uh, I'm amazed that you spelled the word Gretsch correctly. Nice, well done. Well, that's like you've earned, if you can spell it right, you've earned that guitar. Excellent. I believe that you have mentioned in the past that you are considering a baritone guitar. So um, for those of you who don't know, baritone a guitar essentially is longer, right? It's longer. The strings are tuned lower than, you know, a regular, um, a regular guitar. Here's something I don't know for sure, Scott, and maybe you know. Do you need to buy different strings for baritone? I'm sure you're, I'm sure there's someone out there marketing them, but do you actually have to buy different strings? And I'm guessing you do, you do. Um, so, but let us know in the chat. I'm curious about that, Scott, if uh, if if you had to buy. In which case though, if you do have to buy special strings, I, I advise you to stock up, get a couple of sets, you know, in advance. Uh, but that's excellent. Congratulations. And let us know when it arrives. Uh, huh. Yeah, John. John is saying to me not to lose my cool with my students. Nah, nah. I, I never had any cool. I never had any to lose. <laughs> um, but yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, it's all about patience, especially with a kid. The main thing is is to us, uh, you know, with with all of all of my students, but especially my younger students. You know, right? They have decades and decades ahead of them. Don't you all wish you started with a half decent teacher at six years old? Right? Maybe a few of you did, but I mean, I wish we all did. Right? That's that's fantastic. Pat, hey, welcome, Pat. 
Pat is saying some something in between. So you're saying something in between a, a pure strummer and a total pro. Hey, that's a that's a fair answer. Maybe I should have made that one of the um one of the possible answers for the for the poll. I, I appreciate where you're coming from. Time surfing alien says, I really just want to enjoy the journey, and that is the best answer. That's the best answer. You got it. You got it. Um, hey, you guys, uh, don't be shy about asking questions. Um, I see a little bit of, in the chat about people saying, ah, I'm never quite sure what to say. And yeah, I don't know. Ask a question. What the heck? Um, I, I kind of was thinking recently that this notion of dumb questions. I used to say, OK, we're going to open up the chat to, to dumb questions right now. And now I have a better idea. Uh, if you're asking a question that in your heart you think might be a dumb question, just put DQ in advance anytime, starting right now. Just put DQ in advance. And then if for any reason anyone in the universe thinks you're asking a dumb question, you could say, I know I put DQ ahead of it. I know it's a dumb question, but it bugged me. And you guys have heard, I've I've sort of put some of my own dumb questions out there, like uh, like what's harder, the guitar or the piano? You know, kind of a dumb question, but that was a fun discussion that we had there about, about that topic way back when. Um, so, uh, so yeah, who knows? <laughs> uh, so Scott, the baritone has heavy strings, almost like a bass. Interesting, interesting, yeah. Okay, um, and don't forget, keep those, uh, keep those poll, uh, keep those poll responses coming. I can see we got a bunch of votes already. Um, Mr. Golden Dome, thank you for joining us. Mr. Golden Dome says, uh, I'm still a new player. I love the different tones that show up when simply removing a finger. Yes, from some of the standard open string chords or hammer on. Oh, exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about. So I'm, I'm Mr. Golden Dome, I'm going to use a C as an example, a C major chord as an example. C major chord and lift off your pointer finger. Ah, C major seven. Oh. Right, you're, you're doing less work, but getting a, a potentially, you know, valuable, richer, not potentially, but you're getting a, a valuable chord that you're going to need sooner or later for doing less work, right? Um, so, yeah, I encourage all of you guys to do that. Um, you know, any chord that you play, lift a finger off, see what happens. Many chords don't have a pinky involved in the chord, right? So that means the pinky is available to add on, you know, to add an extra sound, you know, experiment. You guys might not be able to see this, but I am currently joined in the studio. My first, my first studio guest. Oh, I have two, I, I, am, I now have two guests in the studio. Anyone want to guess who my two guests are? I'll leave it. Put it in the chat. Who are my two guests at the moment? Uh, they are uh, they're twins. I have twins in the studio. Uh, Stephen is asking about the baritone guitar, right? It's about it's three frets longer, essentially, right? Is that a good way to describe it, Scott? Three three um, frets longer. I think so. What I'm what I'm thinking of is um anybody here remember long neck banjos that, that Pete Seeger essentially invented. You know, it's a it's a regular banjo, three frets longer. But as you guys know, the fret spacing you know gets bigger and bigger as you as you go down towards the nut, right? So to add on three more frets to a banjo to any instrument, it's a profound change. I I had a long neck banjo for a little while, a long time ago. Um, not a not a fancy one, but um, uh, pretty pretty inexpensive. But it's pretty cool. I wonder why don't I still have that? I don't know. Okay, Scott Rhodes. And the first question of the night, uh, <laughs> uh, first question of the night is, uh, why do some people consider a capo a cheater's tool for avoiding bar chords when bars are, are so much more movable? You know, they're not really the same thing. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's tempting, and a lot of beginner beginners think, you know, what you just said, a capo eliminates the need for bar chords. And um, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, a capo, a capo simply just changes your reference point on the guitar, right? It, it chops off the guitar. It, it ends the vibrations the same way the nut does naturally right there, right? It ends the vibrations. That's why down here, the, past the headstock, doesn't really sound like much. So the capo is cheating. But, I mean, I can see why people refer to it as a cheating device because it, it, it doesn't... Um, 
it makes our lives so much easier. You know, you're playing a song, you want to change the key of a song, just put a capo on and, and keep playing, right? And no other instrument can do that. The closest I ever came, well, I mean, technically, a, like a, a banjo could do that, stringed instruments. Um, but really, I, no, other stringed instruments typically don't do it. I mean, it's it's possible, but it's not it's not common. It's really a, a guitar thing and, and banjo sometimes. Um, uh, everybody else has to learn. They, they have to learn music theory. They have to learn their complete instrument. And the guitar, you don't, right? You don't you take three chords, I think like a three chord song, and you can change the key just by putting a capo on. And, you know, potentially, you don't even know what your new key is. You just know, same song, capo with the third fret, life is good. And um, that makes everybody jealous, which I get. I get it. Uh, doesn't stop me from using a capo. It should not stop you from using a capo. There are lots of reasons to, to get a decent capo and keep it handy at all times. Uh, number one is a lot of your favorite songs were recorded with a capo on the actual guitar. And if you want to sound like this song, you've got to use a capo. I mean, it's it has nothing to do with how advanced anybody is as a guitar player. If you want to play Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles and sound just like the recording, you have to use a capo. Um, there's, yeah, even if you had a, an extra finger and you could use your sixth finger as a capo, well, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, but if a song has a bar chord, especially you guys, have, I'm sure you've come across songs where there's one bar chord, right? You got um, like a B minor that shows up. You got a G and then a B minor suddenly shows up, you know. Well, a capo is not going to directly solve that issue of whether or not you can play a B minor, you know. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, the closest I ever came to seeing uh, an instrument with a, a virtual capo was an electric keyboard with a transpose button. And it literally said plus one, plus two, or you kept you kept clicking the plus button. And in effect, it was raising the, the sound of the piano uh, up what we would call one fret, a half step. And I think there was a, a negative button, a minus button, and that in effect would be moving things down that direction towards the net. And, um, you know, very cool device, but most electric keyboards, I believe, do not have that. And, uh, I, I use it as a crutch myself. Hey, but crutches are good. Crutches, you need a crutch sometimes. Okay, so nobody has guessed who my my two friends are, my two twins. I have two ladybugs that joined me in the studio just now. So in case you see any uh, UFOs right across your uh, screen right now, two cute little ladybugs. Hopefully it's only two. We'll, we'll find out. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, Stephen is asking, what's the what's the point of a baritone? Is that what you're talking about, Stephen? What's the point of the baritone uh, guitar? Lower sounds, man. Lower sounds, that like the ultimate twang. You know, those nice low sounds, just pure and simple. It's a sound thing. Yeah. Yeah. You got it, Scott. Yeah. I mean, uh, Scott, when you're done with yours, I'll take it. Okay. And, uh, and when I'm done with it, I'll pass it on. But what a cool idea. I imagine, though, it's, you know, a little bit if your left arm has to get used to it. Yeah. OK, so my friends, uh, here's a, a topic I want to throw your way. Again, this is some of the philosophy that bounces into my head at times and ricochets around my skull. You guys, I imagine, are, are uh, experts. You've probably watched a lot of people their YouTube videos, hopefully you've taken a few lessons from private teachers, right? And uh, I'm sure you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? A little bit of everything. And so I'm putting a concept in the chat right now. Teaching versus showing. And um, I'm, I'm going to put this out there as usual. I'm just throwing out this concept for you to, it's in my head, so I want to get it in your head and, and let you uh, deal with it. Um, some people, essentially what they do is they show you. They say, oh, yeah, here's how the song goes. Here's how the strum goes. And strum patterns are probably the most notorious. So when I say showing, I'm using it in a negative way. Someone can show you what to do, but they can't teach you what to do, right? A little bit of discrepancy. So someone might say, oh... You 
know that's how you strum the song. They just showed you how to strum the song. And either they don't have the time or the patience, or maybe they just don't have the the knowledge to go beyond that. They they just showed you. In their point of view, they're like, I just did it, man. Like, if I'm going to do it again, I'll do it again, you know? And, and they're kind of, they're done. They're done. And hey, sometimes that's exactly what you need. You know, just, just show me it and you've got it, got it. Okay, you know, show me which finger did you use on that note? Middle finger, oh, I was using my pinky. I'm gonna switch to middle finger, got it. So, but I'm using it as a little, as a little bit of a negative thing in that some people, all they can do is, is show you. So, you know, for a few decades now, <laughs> I, I've been almost hesitant to show people um, something in terms of like displaying you know like i i can't help but to get my uh my words involved to describe it you know um you know to teach someone first of all you're getting into some subtleties right you have to say you know you have to you have to um describe what you're doing slowly right you have to do it slowly you have to execute it slowly uh you have to stop playing for a minute so that the your friend your student so they can they can have a minute to figure it out. I've had students say to me, stop playing, <laughs> you know, and they're right. At a certain point, the teacher's got to shut it, you know. I mean, a teacher could be your uncle, could be just your neighbor or something. But at a certain point, yeah, a teacher knows that you got to stop and let the student start figuring stuff out, you know. Um, so, yeah, teaching versus showing, to me, um, there's such a big difference. So maybe the next time you're watching a video and you're loving it, or it's just not working for you. Maybe that's that discrepancy or those uh, those labels might help you make sense of it. Oh, so and so showed it, but they didn't really teach it. You know, they, they can show it all day long, but yeah, it's it's not the same, right? And there's exceptions. Like I said, there's times when if you could just see the person do it. I'll give you an example. Uh, sweet child of mine, way up at the 12th, 13th, 14th. 15th fret, you know, some of you I'm sure have worked hard in this sweet child of mine riff. Well, because it involves four, uh, actually he's tuned down, right? Is Slash tuned down for that song? I think he is. Anyways, the, the whether he's tuned down or not, to play that intro riff to Sweet Child of Mine, um, you need four different frets. So as a teacher, I'm in the habit of assigning my fingers one uh, finger per fret. Um, and and I, I would teach, I have taught Sweet Child of Mine with every finger having his own fret. And then I got the bright idea to pull up a video of Slash playing it. And um, on the official, official video for Sweet Child of Mine, they once in a while show just enough of a close-up of Slash's fingers where you can actually see him reaching up with his ring finger to the, the, the highest fret. So instead of using the pinky, which, you know, is... To my way of thinking, is right there, ready for a job. Slash reaches up with his ring finger to get that fret. That's totally his right. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, but my point is, that was Slash showing me how he played the riff. You know, I didn't need him to teach it to me exactly. I just needed to say what what fingers he using. So nothing wrong with someone showing you something, right? It's just that if if you watch a video or if you hang out with a buddy or whatever. And and the 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 knowledge is not being passed clearly from their head to your head. It could be that they're more comfortable showing it to you, and that's that's what that's the limit of what they can do, um, as opposed to you know taking a deep breath and slowing things down, teaching it to you. Yeah, teaching versus showing. So a minute ago when I said that I was hesitant to show, what I was getting at was. Um, it didn't make sense to me to sit there and play it 10 times and look at the student and say, okay, now you do it. You know, I might play it two times, but then immediately, you know, present it written out in tab, play it slowly, and then take a step back and watch the student do it. Anyways, something to, uh, something to think about. Um, John, you're hearing a little tapping, um, in the audio. Yeah. We got to figure out what that is. Um, I believe me, everything you guys hear, everything you see, your whole experience in live stream, I relive it. Uh, I get, you know, I hear it when I, I do the time stamping, including the ads. I have to watch ads, you know, just like you guys. Yep. Yep. I get it. I don't know what that tapping is. Um, I looked into it, uh, did a little troubleshooting 
and I might have to uh, adjust some of the, the settings in uh, in this. Joseph is getting some buffering. I'm sorry about that, Joseph. Um, okay, so how are we doing? Let's look at these poll results. I'm going to see if I can get up there and see those poll results. It looks like we have, remember the question, right? Whose goal is, uh, hey, Bod, whose goal is to be a strummer, sit around the campfire, bang out dozens of tunes, and whose goal is to really mm, be a pro and get a, maybe a smaller number of tunes exactly right? So, so far, the strummer camp, the strummer camp is winning 76% is uh, is voting for strummers, um, is voting for that that uh, attitude. And, and like someone mentioned earlier, there's a big gray area in between, right? Um, oh, so uh, as a young guy, <clears throat> I was a strummer who who had ambitions to be a much more advanced guitar player and, and capable of playing note for note stuff. Um, I, I got so competent at the strumming part that, um, you know, I could start playing gigs and, and doing stuff. Um, but in the back of my mind, I knew that, you know, there are people who are playing circles around me, you know. Um, but then again, I could play 10, 20, 30, 40 tunes, you know. Uh, but my, my strumming was so not particularly creative and definitely not particularly advanced. But anyways, that, that's, that's been my journey. Um, starting off as a, as a, you know, pretty satisfied strummer until I became less satisfying. And it was time to start sinking my teeth into playing things more like the, um, more like the original song and then learning more tricks and stuff and you know so yeah hey i see some super chats coming in thank you so much joseph and steven i really appreciate that um the uh super chat option is always there for you guys it's how you can support what we do here um uh it's that dollar sign down at the bottom of the um of the chat so thank you guys thank you joseph and steven i appreciate that hey speaking of supporting the channel i'm going to do that thing where i put uh a link to Sweetwater in the chat. You guys don't mind, do you? Let's just take a second. Um, it's a way that you can get yourself a little something and support what we do right here. There we go. Thank you for bearing with me, you guys. Okay, so in the chat is my Sweetwater link, my affiliate link. So click on that whenever the time is right. And it's in the description of the video too. For those of you who are watching this in the future and maybe you aren't capable of getting into that chat, it's in the description of the video. And uh, go ahead and buy yourself a little something from Sweetwater and uh, a little tiny bit of their proceeds go back to supporting what we're doing right here. And I thank you, Sweetwater, if you're watching, Mr. Sweetwater. Uh, I've, I, I've, uh, I'm aware of the Sweetwater facility out there in Indiana. It's like a campus. It sounds amazing. Um, I, I would like to, uh, hey, thank you, Chaz. Thank you for your super chat. Um, I would like to visit not only, well, I like to see everything uh, over at Sweetwater. It sounds like a, a wild place, you know, um, not wild, but uh, just an amazing facility. Um, so, okay, um, Joseph is mentioning good old uh, Django Reinhardt. Yeah, Django Reinhardt with uh, less than a complete working hand. Um, to my knowledge, Django Reinhardt, was a, was an experienced guitar player before his his fingers were damaged in a, in a fire. I mean, he knew how to play the guitar is what I'm saying. And so when his ring and his pinky on his fretting hand were no longer um, really capable of much, he he found a way to do it all with his index and middle. And a giant, if I had to name one guitar player, by the way, spoiler, it's going to be Django Reinhardt. If I had to name one guitar player who just came out of nowhere in my little, you know, young mind, I guess technically I was a teenager, maybe 19, maybe 20 years old. And someone turned me on to Django Reinhardt. And I thought, I just never heard anything like that before. Um, th that type of whatever you want to call it, gypsy jazz, um, hot jazz. I, and, then, and then the type of music and then his, his speed. Forget the fact that he was doing it all with two fingers. Oh my God, Django Reinhardt really stands out. We, we've all heard great guitar players and some of them sort of meet your expectations, right? Like, wow, that guy is, you know, I, I recognize that that guy is doing great rock guitar or whatever. 
but then someone comes along and you, it's a whole type of music that you just were not aware of. You know, the, 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 yeah, you guys get what I'm saying. Okay, so Bod, let's get back to your questions. Bod, I see your question here. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, Bod is saying, hi, Jonathan. I am learning bar chords. I'm finding that my ring finger and my pinky keep sliding along my strings. Any advice? Slide. So it sounds like those fingers are not are not um, confident. Yeah, they're not they're not staying put. They're not doing what you what you ask them to do. Maybe they're slipping around a little bit. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It makes sense. Think about it. If you're right-handed, your left hand, your fretting hand, is your weak hand, and of the five fingers on your fretting hand, the ring and the pinky are the least confident, right? And yet we ask them to do the same job as the two most confident fingers. So yeah, it's tricky. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, practice time cures everything in the long run and in the grand scheme of things. But um, I don't want to just tell you, I ah, just practice, you'll take care of it. It seems to me that where you put your thumb is going to make a big, a big um, difference. Because you want those two fingers to stay stable, right? In general, and there are lots and lots of times when you're doing anything on the guitar, when it's practical to have your thumb pointing straight up towards the ceiling. My thumb, I'm going to call that perpendicular to the neck, pointing straight up towards the ceiling. Okay, so having the thumb in that position extended, my thumb is not bent in any way, it's extended, you know, that could add some stability to, to those two fingers. I wish I knew more about human anatomy because um, I would love to, to say to you, oh, your, your tendons need to something or, oh, your muscles, blah, 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 you know, because you're going to take care of this over time. Your ring finger and pinky are going to get just more confident. So what does that mean? It's not just a neurological thing. There's some uh, physiological changes. There must be, right? There must be. So... I'm going to call it, you know, your muscles getting stronger, for lack of a better term. But if any of you out there are, you know, hand surgeons, <laughs> that would be a great time to clarify for all of us. You know, oh, but I was just going to say, coated strings. Coated strings are slippery. So, so, you know, I don't love coated strings. I've tried them, <clears throat> and um, I agree they last longer for sure. But they're slippery, and to me, they just feel a little bit too slick and weird. Um, so yeah, so it could be from the coated strings a little bit, a little bit. Uh, you know, sh making sure your nails are, are sh as short as possible. That's also practical. You know, um, you know, you, I don't know if you can see this, you know, particularly well, but pushing your wrist out away from you, it's not a good habit. It's you know, it's. But as a temporary, as a temporary way to get <clears throat> the ring and pinky to arch over, you know, to arch over the strings you don't want them to touch. I'm illustrating this right now just for the, for the fun of it with an A major bar chord, bar at five, and my three remaining fingers uh, are making the E major formation. Okay, so that's another thing to think about. <clears throat> Got to create that thing I call it a rainbow curve. The 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 not the bar, but the remaining three fingers curving you know over the strings you don't want them to touch and one way to achieve that temporarily is to push your wrist away from you push your wrist away from your body um and the reason i keep saying temporarily is because you know does that look healthy it does not look like a good recipe for someone who wants to be playing the guitar 10 years from now 20 years from now more um but temporarily it helps kind of get those fingers used to curling around and then as soon as possible you want to go back to a more neutral wrist kind of position um so bob those are some of my thoughts about that um and i'm going to go back to the first thing i said which is over time um over time uh those fingers will shape up you know and my final word uh i never judge your overall progress with how bar chords are doing you know that's bar chords are are cool a to z me says bar chords are awesome sure great a little bit easier on electric guitar. You heard it here, folks. If you're doing an acoustic guitar and you're struggling with them, that's understandable. A little bit easier on electric guitar, without a doubt. Um, but just don't judge your overall progress by how, you, how you're how doing with bar chords. Um, 
Scott is giving a shout out to his sweet water rep named Joel. Hey, someday we should we should all uh, we should all like list our sweet water reps. Some of us might have the same rep, right? We might, you know. I think I think my guy is Kevin. You know, my, I, they keep um switching guys on me, but I think my guy is Kevin. Now, it, it is likely there's more than one sweet water rep named Kevin. I I know. I get it. Let's see. Has he sent me an email recently? Yeah, I believe it is his. Uh, his name is Kevin Rowan. R O W A N. So anybody have Kevin Rowan as your sales rep? Uh, seems like a nice guy. I, I'm still getting to know him because um, I think my other guy left and, and Kevin took his place or something. Maybe he got a he got a um, promotion. Hey, Bud. Bud is over in Scotland. Bud, don't you have um, you have an equivalent though, right? You have an equivalent, not Amazon. You know, uh, an online retailer that serves the UK, and you can get like anything from them. I thought you guys had someone over there. Chaz is Aaron, your guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joseph says, can you imagine if Django what what he would have been like if he had all those working fingers? I can't, man. How can he get better? And he always looked, what a cool cucumber, man, Django Reinhardt. Who saw that movie with Sean Penn? Where Sean Penn plays an American guitar player. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. He plays an American guitar player, and he's sort of dreading the uh, a visit from Django Reinhardt. Django Reinhardt is going to come tour the U.S., and Sean Penn's character is dreading something about a moon, the title of um, somebody... Uh, Somebody who has uh, faster fingers than me. It's a cool movie. Um, and you know what? You know, I, as you guys probably do, I watch Sean Penn's hands closely just to confirm that I, I, I assumed it wasn't Sean Penn playing his own jazzy guitar parts, right? Because that's just not fair. Um, and my takeaway, I don't know. I don't know what Sean Penn can or can't do on the guitar. But my takeaway, <clears throat> his hands, especially his left hand, seem so comfortable um, on a guitar that I was pretty convinced that Sean Penn is a perfectly capable guitar player like me, like you, whether or not he was playing the exact jazzy lines or not, you know, but you can tell, you can tell when someone has held a guitar before and when someone just is, is a fish out of water, right? Um, so, Sweet and Lowdown, thank you, Farouk, and welcome to our live chat, Sweet and Lowdown. Nothing about a moon. But there's a cute scene. You know why I'm thinking about a moon? There's a cute scene where Sean Penn's character is sitting on this moon uh, stage prop, right? He's sitting in the moon. The moon is being pulled up to the rafters of the stage. It's an image in my head. Yeah, sweet lowdown, um, Farouk. Um, Farouk, was that a Woody Allen movie? Why do I associate that with Woody Allen? Was he the, the writer, director? Maybe not. Anyways, I recommend the movie. Um, and I recommend any chance you guys have to uh, to watch a video of Django Reinhardt playing um, his partner. Who who knows um, who knows Django Reinhardt's partner, his violin partner. They went way back. They they played together for I mean as as youngish people. Who was Django Reinhardt's violin partner? And I'll tell you why I'm bringing it up because he's awesome. I saw him play one time uh, on violin, and he was a, a, an older guy at that point. It was in the 1990s, I'm pretty sure, uh, outside Chicago at the Ravinia um, Festival grounds. And it is Woody Allen, okay. Um, and the guy sounded great, the, the violinist whose name I will put in the chat just in case nobody knows it. Um, but at that point, because he was an older guy, you know, he would play a solo or play the melody and then someone else would take over and he would close his eyes a little bit, put his head down. <laughs> and then I guess, you know, he would come back and play the next thing. But uh, most sounded great. So anybody know, I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat. And this, oh my God. Oh, what, I got sidetracked for a few years when all I did was play violin. I was still teaching guitar. But I'd wake up in the morning and play violin for a couple of hours. And one of the people I blame for that is Stefan Grappelli, um, who was, you know, partners with uh, Django Reinhardt. 
and that sound man the, the violin and the guitar sound oh it's so good it's so good um uh joseph has, has mentioned that johnny depp is a decent guitar player yeah the the story i always heard was johnny depp went to you know la to be in a band and join to become a, a professional musician and and ended up you know being an actor um yeah, it kills me, man. The, the guitar shop I used to work at, I'll never forget this. A, a fella comes in, clearly a successful professional, great looking suit and tie, you know, $100 haircut, uh, takes a good guitar off the off the wall, sits down, throws his tie over his neck, and just wails on the guitar. And I'm thinking, that's not fair, man. That's not fair that you can be good at more than one thing in life that you have a apparently a, prof a successful professional career and somehow you found time in your life to get really 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 good at the guitar uh well i worked in the, this particular guitar shop for 12 years and i remember very few um um moments where a customer came in and tried out a guitar and made any sort of impression on me whatsoever you know like that's that self-conscious feeling when any of us walk into a guitar store you think the staff is listening to you and you might feel self-conscious about it. Um, even uh, one of my favorite guitar players named Jim Campolongo, Jim Campolongo, um, based in New York City, I believe. And at one time he was joking. And even at his very high level of guitar playing, he said, you know, when I go to a guitar store and try out a guitar, all I can remember is D. I love that story. Um, so my point is, I was that guy working in the guitar store for 12 years. And um, I remember almost nothing. I certainly don't remember being particularly judgmental to anybody who came in and tried any guitar. What I do remember is the handful of people who were so good um, that that's yeah, that's what stands out in my mind. Not not normal people like like, like us. Uh, <clears throat> uh, who did I see? Who did I? Russ? Hey Russ. Um, Russ, uh, I am watching a show based in Australia called The Tourist um, with Jamie Dornan. Is that, is that the guy's name from uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey? Um, the show is, is set in Australia and my wife and I are watching it and we're wondering, is it filmed in Australia? So I don't know, Russ, I thought I'd mention that to you. Um, the Tourist. Cool, cool series. Season two is out, um, but we haven't seen it yet. We've fully, we're we're re-watching season one to prepare us for season two. How do we get in this subject? Um, hey, uh, friends, in just in case you're curious, I'm going to put a website in the chat. A minute ago, I mentioned that I worked at a guitar shop for about 12 years. Mostly I was teaching there. Um, but when I first started, I was doing other stuff like, hold on, okay, there we go. Oh, like just running the cash register and uh, changing strings when someone would bring a guitar in and they'd want a, a, a you know, a new set of strings put on. I was doing that. Eh, I was having a ball, learning a lot about music. Okay, so in case anyone is curious about where did I spend those twelve years, um, here's the website: Hog Eye Music, Evanston, Illinois. Check them out. If any of you, you know, they're just north of Chicago. So if any of you have a reason to be in the Chicago area, you got to go to Hog Eye Music. So there's the website. I just put the Hog Eye Music website in, uh, in the chat. I taught there. I probably worked there for a year or two. Yeah, I probably worked there, worked there for about two years before I started teaching there. And then I, you know, you know, I, I was teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching um, and would work like, you know, I'd run the cash register a little bit. I'd, I'd sort of you know, work there as a manager or whatever, a little bit, it's just a small place. I have so many great memories of, of uh, working at Hog Eye Music. Um, not the least of which was all the great music. I mean, you're around musicians and people are coming and say, oh, check out this CD, check out this cassette. Have you heard this? Whatever. And uh, what an education. And Django Reinhardt is, is an example. Like, I don't know when I would have eventually heard about Django Reinhardt. Um, but I, what I do know is at about 19 or 20 years old, someone popped in a cassette and they just gave me a cassette and said, hey man, you're gonna wanna hear this. Holy cow, you know? Nothing like being around a bunch of musicians, especially open-minded musicians. They're gonna turn you on to so much good stuff, stuff you might never have heard before. 
Um, Surfer Norm. Hey, Surfer Norm. You are watching the Wagaki Band. What's the Wagaki Band? That sounds interesting. Is that sounds good? But yeah, so now you're watching me. All right. Uh, hey, maybe in a perfect world you could watch both. Are you at the venue watching the band right now? And then you're you got you got me on uh, on your phone or something. All right, that sounds good. Okay, so yeah, so check out the Hog Eye Music website and please, if you're in the Chicago area, you gotta go there. Say hi to Jim. Um, watch out, they have limited hours. It's not like they're open nine to nine, seven days a week. So they got limited hours. They're like ten to three or something like that. All acoustic. Okay, acoustic guitar. Acoustic, uh, you know, banjos, mandolins. Um, but check out the website because they sell some vinyl records and all sorts of cool, you know, guitar-related stuff. Um, but I, I, that was my, uh, you know, that was my, you know, college education, so to speak. Um, that was my certainly was my graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school. That was my graduate school working there. A uh, couple of things that that I became very aware of very quickly. Everyone who worked there, everyone who I met there, everybody played more than one stringed instrument. You might be a guitar player, but you definitely played some mandolin on the side. You might be a, a guitar player, but you played some fiddle on the side. You played mandolin, and plenty of people played, played three or four stringed instruments. And everybody sang. You know, no one is too shy to sing. Everyone, everyone sang. <clears throat> and it just became, you know that sort of set a standard for me, like, well, you know, I kind of curious about the banjo. I, I think I pick up a little bit of banjo. I took a banjo lesson, you know, we had mandolins hang there, I tried a mandolin. So that was one of my takeaways. And also that the musicians that, that I met, whether they were teachers at that shop, the owner of the store, um, the people who would come, you know, come in, open-minded, open-minded people, you know, they, the blues might be their their main thing, but they were very familiar with bluegrass. They were very familiar with Django Reinhardt. They could play a little bit of jazz and they listen to everything. And that's, that's just a great, um, it's a, it's a great way to, uh, to be a musical person, you know, keep your, keep your mind open and, and hang out with other people with open minds that, you know, people who are, who are, uh, more experienced than you, I don't know. It's great. You know, you always want to be around uh, at least a few people who can show you stuff, can turn you on to stuff and so on and so on. OK. Uh, Surfer Norma is saying the Wagaki band, um, they're a Japanese progressive rock band with Western and Japanese instruments. Love it. Love it. Love it. OK. So uh, keep the questions coming in, my friends. But I am going to ask you something. OK. A while back, I pledged that in 2024, my next book was going to be a book full of chord melodies. You guys know I love playing chord melodies, teaching chord melodies. Um, so I would like your suggestions. I'm taking requests, basically. Hold on. Before you start throwing them at me, I'm going to show you. I have here in my hand um, the ones that I've already done. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to hold this up. I'm going to read these out to you. Um, but the, the, what I'm looking for, for suggestions for chord melody arrangements to help fill out this book, I have 18 so far, but who wants to stop at 18, right? Here's what I'm looking for. Songs that are well-known, the more well-known, the better. Songs that are either slow or would sound perfectly okay played a little bit on the slow side, right? Songs that use regular chords. Um, I'm not looking for jazz tunes because um, in general that's that's they need jazz chords and um, that I'm not looking for jazzy tunes. Um, okay, so before you make any requests, I do I really do want your requests here. Here's what I have so far. These are ones I've already done. Okay, for those of you who are listening and cannot see my list. Okay, in alphabetical order. I've already done chord melody arrangements. These are ones that are pretty much going to be in the book. After the Gold Rush by Neil Young, Alice's Restaurant by Olive Guthrie, of course. Old Lang Syne, Autumn Leaves. I know Autumn Leaves technically is a jazz tune, but I found a way to do it with easy chords. Can't help falling in love, good old Elvis. Cockles and Muscles, the Irish folk tune. Fields of Gold by Sting. Uh, by the way, quick digression. When Paul McCartney was asked, are there any, you know, contemporary songs 
that you hear, you think, oh, God, that's a beautiful song. I wish I wish I'd written that song. He named Fields of Gold by Sting. That's an interesting answer. Uh, Georgia on my mind. Let it be by the Beatles. Minuet in G, Moon River. Morning has broken. Cat Stevens, right? Send in the clowns. I'll tell you a funny story about sending the clowns in a minute. Summertime. What a wonderful world. Good old Louis Armstrong. Uh, when Irish eyes are smiling, wild mountain time and a friend by Carol King. Those are the ones I've already done. Okay. So you can, some of you might, you know, look at that and say, okay, I kind of get a vibe here, you know, from these. <clears throat> I am open-minded, but I figured showing you guys the list gives you a little sense for, you know, where I'm coming from. Okay. So what I'm asking you guys to do is give me some more ideas. I mean, the more, the better. If some of you have 10 ideas, give me 10 ideas. Um, uh, you can put it in the chat. Tell you what, if you want to, I'm going to put my email address in the chat because some of you might think of this an idea later or some of you may be watching this in the future. Okay, info at song-bike.com. Um, I guess emailing is obviously totally fine, um, but feel free to put them in the chat, okay? Uh, here's my story behind sending the clowns. I think I told you guys this story before. I was doing a video a day for a little bit over a year. And uh, I got in this groove. I'm just cranking out these videos every day. And now it's a playlist called 365 Riffs for Beginning Guitar. And a woman uh, emailed or commented and said, hey, um, I'd like to learn uh, Send in the Clowns. And her timing was just right. And... Uh, I, I happen to have um, a sort of a piano arrangement of Sending the Clowns. And I, I thought, oh, my gosh, I could actually bang this out for tomorrow's video. I mean, it's like she mentioned it on Wednesday and like Thursday lunchtime. There's the video. And I thought I was very proud of myself. And I thought, I wonder I wonder if she ever found out that I did that. Like, hopefully she did. But I thought that this might blow her mind. Like, oh, my God, the guy, what, that's turnaround time. That's that's good turnaround time, you know. Um, anyway, so that's my connection with Send in the Clowns. Okay, so what do you guys think? Um, maybe 30 songs, 30, 30 chord melodies. That's going to easily be 90 pages. That That's a healthy selection. Oh, there are no Christmas songs on the list. And here's why. I've got that Christmas book. And bear with me, folks. The Christmas book. Ah, I knew I brought this for some reason. Um, there's 31 Christmas chord melodies in the complete Christmas songbook by me, Jonathan Q. Um, so I might throw out a couple, I might put a couple, I mean, in, in the upcoming chord melody ebook. Um, I might put a couple of Christmas tunes, but, um, I'm looking for suggestions that are non-Christmas tunes, um, even though... Christmas tunes work so well as chord melodies. They, they, they're exactly what I'm looking for, that type of thing. Slow, pretty, you know. Okay, so I look forward to any suggestions. Um, Surfer Norm is suggesting uh, wide open spaces. Um, Galveston, oh, Galveston, yeah. Wide open spaces, why do I, who's famous for that? <clears throat> A to Z, me, Tom Waits, great idea. Hope that I don't fall in love with you. <clears throat> a, a few years back, Definitely before the pandemic, Tom Waits was a guest at um, the South by Southwest music um, media thing in down in Austin, Texas. I'm pretty sure that was the context. And Tom Waits, uh, you know, put on a show where he did a bunch of his old songs. I, I maybe even hope that I don't fall in love with you. And uh, and um, that's kind of unheard of, right? Tom Waits, uh, my, the the two times I've seen him live um, in my understanding is that he just doesn't do his old stuff. He's, he does his, you know, later career stuff for the most part. Um, so that's a great idea. A to see me. Great. Love that too. Hope that I'll fall in love with you. That was covered by Darius Rucker. Um, some of us know him as Hootie from Hootie and the Blowfish. I think Darius Rucker is one of the more famous people that covered that too. Hope that I'll fall in love with you. Um, Ron D, Sloop John B, great idea. Surfer Norm, okay. Dixie Chicks, wide open spaces. Okay, yeah, keep keep them coming in. Because <clears throat> you guys, I mean, this is exactly what I need. So, 
I'm going to take a break for a moment. Tonight's live stream, again, sponsored by Vitamin Water. We are working with a Power C, uh, Power C flavor. Mm. Works for me. If only Vitamin Water did sponsor this, how cool would that be? You know, why not? It could uh, pay some bills, maybe. That's all right. Um, so uh, John is asking about the Blues book. Thank you for asking. Okay. He's asking about this book, which around Christmas time, the only way you could get the e-book called The Song Bike Blues Guide was by buying the Christmas book, and it was like a freebie. Um, you know, I may at some point uh, make this a free item um, where like you all you'd have to do is um provide your email address and you get a copy of it because it's it was kind of i kind of wrote it with that in mind um i have a buddy who's working with me um he's uh has his own marketing business and he's giving me ideas of how i can take what i do to the next level and he said hey you know what you need you need something on your website where people get it for free and then you have a database of um you know, email addresses, and then you can reach out and let those people know you have a new book and so on. So in the back of my mind, as I was doing this loose book, um, was making it short and sweet and um, the kind of thing that you could, uh, I'd be, you know, capable of giving away for free and um, and using it as a way to attract new people to, to what I do, what we do here, you know. So probably, I don't want to promise anything, but let's say I'm hoping in the month of February, this will be available for free. And you just type in your email address. And then moments later, the, the, the electronic version, not, not the paper, not the hard copy, but the, the PDF shows up. Um, I love this. It's, it's awesome. It's only uh, 14 pages. Well, but the first couple of pages don't really count, right? So it's about, let's call it 10 or 11 pages. It's got so much cool, easy stuff in it. It's exactly... You know, it's a cute little, it's a little guide to play blue stuff. Anyways, um, if you're curious what's in here, just go to my YouTube channel right here. And one of the videos I posted in December, I guess, is um, everything in the book in one video. Um, it doesn't have tab or PDFs or anything. It's just, it's me demonstrating everything in the book, um, which is I'm pretty short video. So I, that would let you know what's in the ebook. Um and yeah, it was fun. It was fun to do it. So thanks for asking, John. And if you guys don't have a copy of it yet, um, hang in there. And uh, I'll let you know when it's like officially available for free. Okay. Um, Scott is making some some suggestions for chord melodies. Forever Young. Good old Bob Dylan. Yeah. Love is all around. Oh, yeah. Love is all around. Um, the Trogs did that. I think of that. That's the song from Love Actually, right? Am I think of that same song? Um from the Love Actually movie uh, that gets featured in that movie, I think it is, where they change, <laughs> they change the lyrics to, to be Christmassy, and they they have to mess with the syllables. Uh, pretty um, pretty funny. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, please do. I'm gonna move on, but please do keep those uh, suggestions coming in because um, you guys you guys are my um, you guys are my test group, so to speak. You know. Uh, wow, Joseph. Joseph says his grandfather was a good violinist. He had a violin that was handed down for four generations. Whoa! And someone stole it. Oh, come on, man. Ah, oh, it's heartbreaking. Ah, oh, it's not the way life is supposed to be. And he played the mandolin also. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Some of you guys might know <clears throat> a mandolin is just a sideways violin. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, it's a violin that you hold like a guitar. You know, yes, it has double strings. But anybody who's a pretty decent violinist can pick up a mandolin and start playing some mandolin. Opposite direction is a little bit tricky because getting used to a pick, a guitar pick, you know, to pluck the mandolin is is not a huge thing. Whereas going from a mandolin to a violin, getting used to the violin bow, I can only tell you that my experience with a violin bow, man, violin bows are tricky. That's a whole... I was sitting next to a buddy of mine at college graduation, and he had been a double major in viola and English, maybe. 
And so we're sitting there watching graduation happen. We're chatting about the future. And, and I, I was um, um, just, I forget if I was starting to play the violin yet or Amir is curious. Um, but the bottom line is, he said, you know, people get intimidated about the left hand of the violin because there's no frets, right? You guys know that, right? Violinists basically have to learn where to put their fingers by ear, by practice, all the above. He said people get scared. They think that's the hard part about violin. He said that finding the notes, fretting, you make serious progress and you get to the point where you, you can do it. I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying, I'm paraphrasing, but he said you spend your life working on your bowing technique and your bowing touch. That's, you, you never you never stop working on that. So anyways, I took that to heart and I'm sharing that with you. Uh, and yeah, that's <laughs> that's one of my, my most profound memories of my college graduation. I, I, I don't remember the speeches or other stuff too much. Um, uh, many vibes, yes, thank you. Many vibes, you might've missed um, my first description. And so thank you for reminding me. So the poll question up above, um, a strummer is someone who can bang out a bunch of songs around the campfire. People can sing along, um, but the strummer is not making an attempt to play every song with every note for note detail um, because that's not their goal. You know, I get that. Okay, so Total Pro, um, I, I wasn't sure how else to describe it, so that's what I call it. Total Pro is someone, and you may be that person many times, who would rather work on fewer tunes, maybe a lot fewer tunes, but play every note exactly like the original, you know? So I didn't know what else to call that. So I just said total pro. Um, uh, so yeah, so many vibes. Have you voted? Where would you fall? Um, and yes, I'm aware there's a gray area in between. And um, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> total pro. All right. That's great. And, and you know, I, I, I mentioned that I was definitely a strummer um, that I, I'm still a strummer with with um, hopes of getting more and more awesome skills, you know, but I, I'll tell you what, though, I realized very quickly that memorizing, you know, basically, if you can bang out a song and sing it all the way through, people want to listen to that, you know, you can you can get gigs, you can People hand you a guitar and they say, play something, you know, and uh, and there's benefits to that. Um, but then I'd hand the guitar to someone else and they'd play a much harder song so well. I think, oh, you know, the journey never ends, as many vibes says. Yes, the journey never ends. And why would you want it to end, right? Why would you want it to end? Okay, so don't forget to keep those questions coming in. i am uh, got my eye on the clock. I don't know why not. Um, so, the, oh, let's get into our chord family of the night and and uh and our song our play along song some of you may be wondering why i have this piece of paper right here and it's not what you think it's not for writing on although it is gonna be in a minute watch this if i take away this piece of paper watch what the camera does see that see how it corrects i get it i mean i and now we're back to a more natural look right um so I got I got to figure how to get it, get the camera to not do that. I'm sure it's a simple thing. Put it in the chat if you know how how I can do that. Put it in the chat. You know how do I get my camera to to stay like it is right now, even if I take away the paper? I don't know. You know, um, <laughs> A to Z me. I see your question. It's, it's <laughs> I'm gonna have to give that some thought. You know. Uh, okay. Oh, so um. So our secondary purpose of having the paper there is to write on our chord family of the night. I might um okay. Just want to double check. Our chord family is gonna go. I'm gonna turn the paper to turn it this way. That way. Okay. Now these are easy chords. C major to A7. What? Some of you are already like, what? To D7. To G7. Can you tell, like, I just, blank paper and a Sharpie, 
I'm like, I'm in, I'm in heaven right now. It's my idea of a good time, man. The, the possibilities are endless. Uh, um, okay, so uh, what is going on with those chords? Now, some of you are like, whatever, it's four chords. Good, good. That's that's a good attitude, you know. Some of you are like, that makes no sense. Um, you know, if we're in the key of C, A7 is not a chord and D7 is not a chord. The G7 is a chord you might see in the key of C, but, you know, those two chords are freaking you out. Uh, two middle chords, C, A7, D7, G7. Some of you are like, well, then we're not in the key of C. But then what key are we in? Well, it makes no sense, right? Okay, bear with me. Um, for those of you who are like I used to be, what I'm writing on the bottom of the page makes more sense. C, A minor, D minor, G7. Some of you are like, ah, back to my comfort zone yeah what i just wrote the bottom of the page c a minor d minor g7 those are chords in the key of c and every chord there would be described as diatonic diatonic is a fancy way of saying they all make sense together and they're there it, it just works c a minor d minor to g7 you've all heard that a million times Right? Um, okay, so that's a set of diatonic chords. Every note that makes up every single one of those chords are all from the C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and life is good. The top one does not make sense. You're not expecting the A7, the D7. Okay, so what's going on here? Substituting seventh chords or dominant seven chords, if you want to call them by the full name, substituting them for, in this case, for, for minor chords, right? Are you allowed to do that? Yes. Are those chords called diatonic? No, you know, secondary dominance, right? That's what we're getting into, secondary dominance. Um, the G7 though, the G7 is a diatonic chord. It serves a purpose. The G7 chord, any seventh chord, any dominant seventh chord has a built-in tension and its tension can only be resolved by a partner. C major is the partner to G7, okay? So this G7, by the way, this is gonna repeat over and over again. Uh, C, A7, D7, G7, C, A7, D7, is gonna repeat over and over again. Um, the G7 makes a ton of sense. It's That is literally how you get back musically to a C chord. Again, the G7 chord has some built-in tension, like every seventh chord does, every dominant seventh chord. It has some tension, and that tension can only be resolved by a C major chord. Quick mention, it's totally possible that you'll see a G7 chord and the next chord is not C. It's possible, sure, sure. But <clears throat> it's extremely likely that you'll see a, C, a G7 chord that does lead back to C. Okay, so again, let's get back to these two in-between chords. What the heck? Secondary dominant chords. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna actually start on the D7. Okay, let's just treat D7 we're going to isolate it, okay? D7. D7 is, has built-in tension, and its tension is only resolved by a G chord, okay? So it totally makes sense to have a D7 right before a G chord, except it's not just a G chord, it's a G7. That means there's still this, now this new tension, right? That's okay, that's okay. But D7 got us to that G7. And I want you to think of dominoes. These seventh chords are like wobbly. They're wobbly dominoes. They're like, you hit them on the guitar and that tension, imagine a wobbly domino. And that wobbly D7 domino, it bumps into the wobbly G7 domino. And then the G7 domino finally bumps into the C major and the whole thing starts again, okay? So that is how I'm currently justifying where this D7 chord comes in when it's not a chord that's allowable or legal in the key of C. It sets up the G7, and you can use it. It's okay. Um, I'm going to say the same thing about A7. See that A7 right there? The A dominant seventh chord, full of tension, it gets resolved by, guess what, a D chord. So that explains why someone got the bright idea to put an A7 right before the D7. Now, I realize this logic. I realize I'm working backwards. I'm saying 
well, we need the G7 to get back to C. And we're setting up that G7 with the D7. We're setting up the D7 with the A7. I realize this is a weird logic, but that's the best way I know how to describe it, you know. But we're not done yet, okay? Bottom line is, though, in isolation, A7 chords love to be followed by a D chord. And since this is a D7, there's still this tension, right? So the D7, D7s love to be followed by G chords, but the G chord has its own tension, but it's a tension that we want because it gets us back to the C chord. Okay, so what I'm not doing yet is I'm not showing you, well, wait, who got the bright idea to go from C to A7? That's, that's a weird idea. Like that's, you know, how do you justify that, Mr. Big Shot YouTuber? It's a fair question. It's a fair question. Um, I'm going to answer it two ways. Number one, it just sounds good. And you'll see when we play it in a minute. It, it sounds so cool to go from C to A7. It's just a cool sound. Um, if I, if you held my feet to the fire, I might point out that the C major chord, I'm going to write a little bit smaller up here. The C major chord has three ingredients, C, E, and G. Okay. The A7 chord has four ingredients, A, C sharp, E, and G. But hey, they have two things in common. They both have the E, G in common, right? And the C note from the C major chord is literally the closest possible note to C sharp. So that's not a big jump logically, right? Just take the C and turn it into a C sharp. That's not a crazy idea. The A, okay, the A kind of comes out of nowhere. I got that. Anyways, that's my, that's another way. Um, not very scientific, I know, but another way to say that, hey, CNA7 is not as crazy an idea as it might appear to those of you who do a lot of C to A minor. I get it, you know, C to A7, you know, it's a little bit weird. Okay, so what are we even talking about here? Um, yeah, Joseph Galasso is mentioning the turnaround chord. Yeah, you could say the A7 is a turnaround chord that sends you to D, and the D7 is a turnaround chord that sends you to G, and the G7, like I keep saying, is the turnaround chord that gets us back to C, and the presumption here is we want to get back to C. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna play for a second. <clears throat> we're, we're, we'll do the official play along in a minute, but I'm going to play for a second so that you can hear what's going on here. I'm going to go C, A7, D7, G7. Once I run through the chords, listen for the, the little uh, walk down that I employ to get from the C to A7 to set to set your mind up for that sound. Okay, so here's the C7 and A7. There's a G7 back to So right now it's sort of like, okay, so what is it, right? What is it? Okay, so I'm gonna put it to words. We'll do the play along part in a minute. I wanna make sure I get the right, the right rhythm. Here's the walk down from C major down to A7. But watch what I do here. I got the two in my head. We are about to play Salty Dog. That's right, Salty Dog. Uh, it's an old folk tune. You might say, wait a minute, usually we play, you know, Tom Petty, Buddy Holly. Ooh, uh, February 3rd, the day the music died, right? I would have chosen a Buddy Holly song to do tonight, the anniversary of his passing. Um, we did Buddy Holly a couple weeks ago um, for our play along, but didn't want to hesitate, didn't want to neglect to. Nope, the anniversary, Buddy Holly, 23 years old, barely 23 years old. Um, it's a shame. The Big Bopper, uh, Richie Valens, all in the same plane. Holy cow. The pilot of the plane, not good. So, yeah, February 3rd is the anniversary. Okay, so Salty Dog. Uh, again, let me sort out my brain, and then I will include all of you. 
Um, but there's there's a chord progression right there. Let me be your salty dog. I don't want to be your lady. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Okay, so we're not gonna we're gonna keep the chords the same, but I'm gonna start off with simple strumming uh, for Salty Dog. I'm gonna start off with simple strumming, and then I'm I'm not gonna change the, the overall timing, um, the duration of each chord, but I'll get a little uh, I'll get a little fancy. Many vibes. Thank you for joining in. And yes, uh, you gotta make dinner. Hey, someone's gotta do it. Looks like you gotta do it. We'll be here. Don't worry. Check it out tomorrow. Uh, thank you for joining us, Many Vibes. So I'm going to change from, <clears throat> excuse me, four strums per chord, <clears throat> four strums on the C, four on the A7. I'm going to change from that to getting a little more boom chicky, a little more bluegrassy, folky, you know, um, because, hey, I want you to know that's an option too. Okay, I need to do one hydration. Okay, so you uh, can do four simple strums along with me. Great. About that speed right there. Yep. Um, or either from the very beginning or as you get more comfortable, you can turn it into four boom chicks. When I do the boom chick, root note first. On the C, I'm hitting the fifth string. On the A, A7, I'm hitting the fifth string. D7 is going to be fourth string. The D string, right? G7, the sixth string. Okay. Um, let's just do it. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the dilemma of soloing on top of this, because soloing on top of it is, put it this way, it's not just like a, a pentatonic scale and you're all set. Okay, let's just do it. I got my lyrics. Standing on the corner with the low-down blues, great big hole in the bottom of my shoes. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Okay, I got to get a little more comfortable when I move this that way. Move me this way. All right, let's do it. I'm going to start uh, on the C chord, but the vocal enters on the A7. Now you know. Here we go, on the count of four. I'll see you on the other side. We'll talk all about it. Uh, on the count of four, four strums in the C, and the vocal comes in on the A7. Okay, you got it. One, two, here we go. Stand on the chord with in the bottom of my shoes, but I let me be your salty dog. There we go. Here comes the A7. Let me be your salty dog. I won't be your man at all. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Okay, so we get this, this be this four strums. Here it comes going to the A7 right now. Down in the wild woods, sitting on a log, finger on the trigger, and eye on a hawk. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Okay, here comes the walk down. I'm going to walk down from C to A7. Let me be your salty dog. I won't be your man at all. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Look at here, Sal. I know you run down stocking in a worn out shoe. Honey, let me be your salty dog. Hold the trigger and the gun set go. Shot fell over Mexico. Honey, let me be your salty dog. All right, you feeling folky? How'd you do? All right, so thank you for, for bearing with me as I sorted that out. I'm so used to jumping in and playing it that I had to access that other part of my brain and, uh, and teach it, like I was saying before, right? You got to teaching is different than showing, you know? Okay, so for the record. Dun, 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 
the if you're doing just simple down strums, that's great. Yeah. Let me be your salty dog. I won't be your man at all. And you know what? Nothing wrong with keeping your strumming simple if the chord changes are taking all of your attention. That's great. Um, I don't have much advice except C to A7. Your middle finger can stay there. And you know why the middle finger can stay there? Because the middle finger is on the note E, and E is in both chords. There you go. Okay. If you're doing the boom chick strumming, which is, you know, it, it sounds better, right? That boom chick, boom chick, boom chick. Um, it's four boom chicks per chord, right? Even if you do them slower, I recommend the boom chick strumming, even if the speed is like standing on the corner, low down boom. Hole in the bottom of my shoes. There we go. Honey, let me. Even at this slow tempo, you're going to get good at boom chick strums and chord changes. Nothing wrong with slowing things down. Okay. So I was in a situation once where someone said, hey, they're playing, I think it was this exact tune or something extremely similar with these secondary dominance, these, you know, non diatonic chords. And like, Jonathan, play a solo. And I was like, oh, yeah, key is C. And I realized very quickly that like a C major pentatonic was not gonna was not gonna sound good here um, because like literally the song you could say it changes keys. I've got a workaround for you because um, <clears throat> instead of trying to find one scale that's the perfect scale or trying to find um, or, or changing scales every time the band changes to a chord you don't have time to. My friends, welcome to the world world of arpeggios. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, uh, let me be your salty dog. Don't want to be your man at all. Let me be your salty dog. Okay, so I'm simply playing the same four chords higher up the neck, and I'm going to have some fun arpeggiating them because that makes it sound like a solo. So. Dancing around a little bit. No, you can't see my right hand too clearly. So, the right hand, you're going to be free to arpeggiate in any way you choose. So, I'm, I don't want to focus on that too much at the moment. Let's talk about playing C, A7, D7, G7, playing them higher up the neck. Why would you want to play higher up the neck? So you can hear yourself, so people can hear you um, on top of whoever is strumming the chords down there, you know? Um, okay, so you could play C like an F chord. Right? I know some of you guys are not 100% comfortable with F. Take your F chord, move it up to the 8th, 9th, and 10th fret. There's your C. Okay? So the band is on that C chord for those boom, four boom chicks, boom chicks. And you can... One, two, three, four. I'm just dancing around and just arpeggiating, right? Next chord, A7, okay? You don't want to play any A7. You want to play an A7 that's really close to that C. And I, I got you. I got you. A7. 9, 8, 9 on the three treble strings. It's a D7 chord. It's a D7 formation, I should say, up at that ninth and eighth, eighth and ninth frets. Okay? That's an A7 chord. Okay? Dance around a little bit with your thin hand. You're soloing, right? You're, you know. So you only have four counts, though. One, two, three, four. Now the band changed to D7. Look at this. Watch, watch my ring finger. Ring finger backwards one fret on the skinny E string. It was at nine. Now it's at eight. I'm going to put my index finger across at uh, seven, making a little bar on the four treble strings. That's a D7 chord. From first skinny string over, it's... Eight, seven, seven, seven. Okay. And lastly, the band changed to G, uh, sorry, G, G is in golf, G7. Watch my ring finger again, backwards, just one more fret. And there's the G7. Also, it's the same grip as you did for the A7. 
except now you're at the sixth and seventh frets. That formation is known as the D7 formation, but because you're up at the sixth and seventh frets, the name is G7. Okay, so don't forget, you can always go back and watch this, right? You don't have to memorize this right now. Here's my C for four counts, four slow counts for our purposes. Here's my C, two, three, four. Here's my A7. Here's my D7. And lastly, G7. And you've got a cute little solo, you know. In fact, you don't even necessarily have to arpeggiate the chords as individual strings. You can just be like... I mean, I'm just doing some fast little down ups, you know, um, so you don't even have to pick them out as individual things. In fact, that doesn't that get kind of a mandolin ukulele kind of vibe? Why are we having this conversation? I will tell you, I'll remind you. Um, because of those non diatonic chords, there's not one simple scale um, that I could just say, oh, solo with this pentatonic scale, and you're all set for the whole song. That would be the correct thing to do. I mean, a, a good option. For that bottom chord progression c a minor d minor g7 but you get why it's it's take my word for it, it's not going to work well for the salty dog chord progression um uh so yeah all right uh blah, blah, blah. i'm looking at your comments here um yeah uh joseph i'm um, flat and scruggs um I do a version of it uh doc watts I'm, I'm sure i must have heard doc watts and lots of people have done versions of it um in my mind, it's like the number one example, in, in my experience, um, of a song that does this whole um, secondary dominant thing where like, you know, you, it's Salty Dog. In my mind, it's like, I, if I see it in another song, I say, oh, there's that Salty Dog thing. So for me, it's, that, it's my reference point, you know. Um, and it has tons of verses. It's a folk tune, right? It's a folk tune. Um, and so there's there's i'm sure there's verses that i've never heard before and yeah fun thing okay so uh okay so one i brought this up for a couple of reasons um tonight i mean i chose it for tonight for a couple of reasons um the whole notion of having a chord family that's a little bit unique you know and and there you go right there um and then uh hey we haven't done like a folky folky tune and I can get folky with the best of my friends. You know, some people think folk music is just some guy with an acoustic guitar, some woman with an acoustic guitar. And, it, it, you know, it, it's, there's a whole history going on here. I mean, music that goes back, you know, centuries. You know, I, I'm a folk fan. Um, uh, you know, I love, I love the history behind this stuff. Um, songs that have been around for ages and ages and ages and then and then the, the players who over the years have have kept that music alive um great stuff and it, uh the deeper you dig the more you find you know um and i was fortunate like i was kind of alluding to earlier to be around people who would who would turn me on to stuff you know and uh and once once one once someone turns you on to something new you are so open and ready for the next thing they have for you, right? Well, if you like that, you might like this. Yes, I, I would like that. Um, so much great stuff and so many great players. Okay, so uh, thank you, friends. I'm looking at the clock. We got a little time left, but don't hesitate to put in questions in the question marks. Ron says, would we call this caged triads? Um, you could. You could. What I did just there, um, uh, you know, drew upon the caged system in the sense that you guys heard me say, well, it's like a D7 formation, um, but you're doing it higher up. So, yeah, the, like, like I've said before, I just learned that. I learned what I just said to you. You know, I didn't learn like, you know, the letter D from the word caged, you know, means you do this thing with a D and then you turn it into a bar chord and that whole system perfectly valid system but again it's just not how i how i think about it um 
Live to Fly says, uh, you rock, Jonathan. I learned a fun song. I'm going to slam on those tries. Yeah, it's a fun song to play. Um, uh, so, Ron, someone who is, you know, who learned this, who, who is very comfortable with the cage system, they would say, yes, Ron, that's that's what the cage system is all about. Um, <clears throat> just two different ways to get to the same point. Here's what I didn't mention explicitly. <laughs> That nice little walk down, getting getting us from C to A7. So let's say I was going to st start the tune off on a C chord, you know, and I'm, I'm doing a little boom chick, because that walk down works best in the boom chick context. Okay. And I'm getting ready to get to the A7, and whenever I'm ready, That's, that's, that's my um, how I'm going to get there, right? So in slow motion, I'm hitting the fifth string, the A string with my pick. That's the boom. I'm strumming lightly on three or so treble strings. When I'm good and ready to start the tune, i got to get to that A7. Remember, the vocals didn't come in until the A7. In slow motion, I'm hitting that, that C note twice. That's the fifth string, third fret. Same string, second fret, middle finger, once. Same string, first fret, index finger, once. That's my walk down. Same string, open, because that's exactly what I want to hit to get into the boom chick of the A7 chord. It's the open fifth string. That's the boom. And I'm good to go. So one more time without so much talking. Slowly. Technically, I could begin my vocal on that as soon as I hit that open uh, A string. Uh, Let me be a salted dog. You know that you could begin the vocal right there. The vocal, by the way, is the note E. I'm fretting the fourth string, second fret. That's the note E. That's that's where the vocal. Let me be. So anyways, that walk down, it's just not that hard, but it sounds so good, right? You know? um, and by the way, you know, another reason why I'm going to, I'm going to strongly suggest that you put that into the playing. That's a moment in the song uh, where there's no vocal. What else are you going to do? There's nothing, there's no singing. You might as well. that in as you go to the next vocal. I'm looking at my ladybug. I see one ladybug here. What happened to the second ladybug? Oh, well. Okay, so there's oh, there's the uh, there's the walk down. What a cool... Oh, chromatic. Chromatic is the word to describe when you play multiple, multiple notes, each one fret apart. Third fret, second fret, first fret, open. That sound that you're hearing right there, the sound would be described as a chromatic sound, and certainly the, the notes, that's a chromatic run. C, down a half step to B, down a half step to B flat, down a half step to A. What a cool sound. Chromatic run. Okay. Uh, I'm going to scroll to make sure there's no questions that uh, I have missed. And um, hey, poll results. Ooh, the total pros are uh, are are. Uh, we have 46 votes in so far. The total pro camp is uh, inching up a little bit. We have two thirds, almost exactly two thirds, of uh, of live chatters uh, voted. Um, their goal is to be a strummer, being able to bang out a bunch of tunes around the campfire, that type of thing, where you know the chords and you can play them and and strum them, and that's where you want to be. And 37% though say nope. I would. I, my goal is to learn a song as close to the original recording as humanly possible and get really good um, with the understanding that that hey that might limit how many songs you know. Nothing wrong with that. But I, I love uh, getting feedback from you guys. Um, uh, okay, so here's something that I did with a student recently. 
and um, and I thought, you know, I really should share it with you guys because sometimes I have to experience something two or three or four times before I realize, yeah, that's um, that I should probably make that a thing. Okay, we're talking about playing scales with down up picking, and for the fun of it, I'm going to do that. Um, E minor pentatonic down here. Many of you know this scale very well. I'm using my first two fingers, index and middle. Um, I'll put this scale in the in the timestamp when I do it. Um, so you don't have to memorize this if you don't know it yet. But here's what I learned as a teacher. I tell people from the first scale we ever play that you gotta do down up picking. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and so on, right? You got to do down up picking. In fact, it's the best time just to begin down up picking is when you're doing a scale. And what I realized is that can be a big ask. I mean, you know, people would rather just do it with all down strokes or at least not, not be so strict about it, you know? Um, so I thought, well, what if we split the difference? Instead of making every note a fresh, you know, pick, like, you know, you're, you're thinking about your left hand. Meanwhile, I'm bugging about your right hand. It's like, ah, okay. So what if we did a small compromise and did multiple down up strokes on each individual note before we moved on to the next one? I'm going to tilt this camera down because I realized that my right hand isn't always in the shot here. Is that any better? Maybe not. All right. So now you don't have to go that fast, but you get you get the point. It's a little bit. I'm hoping that it's a little bit more. Um, you know, it's a healthy compromise. You got four strokes down, up, down, up, before you have to do something new with the left hand with your fretting hand. And to me, it's like, okay, well, let's give you a chance. To me, it's like, you just got a right hand. Let's give you a chance. So I might start doing this with folks. Um, why not, right? You got what I'm saying that, you know, yeah, you can get used to one task and then move to the next one and have some fun with that one. If my goal is getting you guys good at down up picking, and it is my goal, you know, then then it, what harm does it do to do down up, down up on one note before you go to the next note? It doesn't do it, you know, great. If anything, it furthers the purpose of, of you know, if, if it gets us close to our goal. And um, I thought it'd be a cool workaround. I've never seen anyone else sort of demand, so to speak, that, that that's how you play scales. Um, but why not, right? Why not? I don't know, worth a try. Worth a try. Um, so uh, I got my Sharpie. Oh, oh, don't forget. Um, don't forget, I am still looking. I will always be looking uh, for your song requests for the chord melody ebook that I am going to be putting together soon. Just in case a few of us, a few of you joined me recently. These are the 18 songs that I already have chord melody arrangements of, but I could easily do 10 more, you know, um, in one book. I mean, I think like having 60 in one book, that might be a bit much, you know, but having 30, you know, it's a, it's a good ballpark. So um, I'm definitely open to your suggestions. Um, again, I'm looking for songs that are very well known, um, relatively slow, uh, and songs that the background chords are very basic bread and butter chords c a minor g you know like that so yeah so please keep uh whether it's in the chat or i put my email address in the chat um earlier either way however you want to make your uh, requests um but i really because you guys are gonna songs are gonna come off the top of your head that off the tip of your tongue that i wouldn't have thought of but as soon as you guys say them, i'll be like oh that'd be a great that'd be a great choice like i said um sending the clowns uh, was not one that was on my radar, but when someone requested it, um, I think the arrangement came out really nice. Uh, so, 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at my agenda here and I'm just seeing if there's anything that I have neglected uh, to mention. I think we're doing okay. Um, so I'm scrolling a little bit. Uh, the Pink Panther, right? Josie mentioned the Pink Panther. Yeah, that is a tricky song. Just to, to play the melody of the Pink Panther, that's a good little exercise. Um, there's a cool book. And I'm going to put the name in the in the chat. Although I'm going to Google it to make sure that I'm getting the title right. There's a very cool book uh, that has the Pink Panther in it. And as soon as I confirm the title, there we go. I'm going to put the Amazon link in the chat. Doesn't mean you have to buy it from Amazon. There you go. Okay. Here it comes. The name of the book is Surf and Spy Hits. And I've used this book quite a bit in my teaching. Okay. There's the Amazon link. Um, and the official name of the book is Surf and Spy Hits for Easy Guitar. Um, from the Hal Leonard publisher. Um, uh, these are all instrumental tunes, but um, they are relatively easy. And here's uh, some of the ones featured. The Batman theme song, the Hawaii Five-0 theme song, the James Bond theme song, Miser Lou, Peter Gunn, the Pink Panther theme, uh, Rebel Rouser, Wipeout, Telstar, Ramrod, 40 Miles of Bad Road, which is just a great title. Um, I believe that's Dwayne Eddy. Uh, cannonball. Okay, so um, I, I, I've had a lot of fun with that book. It's from, it's not a new book by any means. Um, Amazon had it listed in 2006, but maybe it was around even before. I guess no, 2006. Okay. Uh, what a cool book. Okay, so um, you just remind me of that, uh, um, Joseph, when you mentioned the Pink Panther um, uh, theme song. Um, so yeah, so very, very cool um, book. However you get it, you don't have to get it from Amazon, um, but I just put the link there so at least you guys could check it out and see the description and stuff and then get it from any place you want to. That's all right. Uh, but it's just a fun book. Hey, um, Learning Guitar Instrumentals is, um, is uh, a valuable pursuit for lots of reasons. Um, you know, the guitar is so, it, you know, whatever the instrumental is, whatever the guitar player is doing, it's so clear, right? You can hear exactly what the guitar is doing and you can, you're not, you know, you're not trying to hear the guitar under the vocals and along with the drums and stuff. Um, and getting good at even just one guitar instrumental gives you a chance to show off a little bit in a good way, right? In a good way, um, uh, in a way that is really going to feature the guitar without anyone saying, oh, are you going to sing or like, oh, whatever, you know. Um, Live to Fly, is it out of stock on the How Leonard website? What? And it's unavailable on Amazon? Wait a minute, seriously? Out of print, limit, oh my God. That's funny. I'm so sorry, you guys. But hey, don't, keep looking for it. Keep looking for it because it's worth it. But are you kidding me? Why would they put that out of print? What a cool book. Oh, it's got to be out there. I'm going to have to guard my copy. Um, many years ago, I bought a coffee table book for, I think, about 100 bucks. Couldn't believe I was spending $100 on, on a book. But it was a, a beautiful coffee table book about um, the earliest Fender Telecasters. Um, Richard, the book was written by Nacho Banos. Some, some of you might have heard that name, Nacho Banos. Um, and he did let's just call it a deep dive into every, you know, really early Fender Telecaster <clears throat> he could find, like to the point where he he allowed, like the owner of, of the guitar, these guitars were thousands of dollars. They would allow him to like photograph it, potentially take some parts off, photograph it, put the neck back on. It's a, it's a beautiful coffee table book. What's my point? What I paid a hundred dollars for now, the book is up to like, 600 bucks like on ebay holy cow i mean i like the book but it's a lot of money i believe it's called the black guard the name of the book is the black guard 
B L A C K G U R A D. Um, very cool book if you're a fan of Telecasters. I mean, it's great. Um, had I known, I might have bought two of them. Yikes. Um, uh, yeah, A A B E books. Live to fly. I suggest an A B E books or A -B books um, as a you know possible way to find it. I can't believe it's out of print. I mean, if I don't know. Anyways, it's a cool book. Well, if it's out of print, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I have a copy. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a way that legally that I could share my copy of it? Um, I mean, the songs are all copywritten. Well, I'll talk to my lawyers. Um, but if it's out of print, then it's out of print, you know, then just sharing pieces of paper with you all. That's all I'm doing. Anyways, great book. I, I hope I hope um, you guys can find a copy if you're so inclined into that that cool, twangy, surfy kind of guitar stuff. Um, some of the songs in there are a little bit harder than others, but nothing. Um, but there's enough ones in there that are a little bit easy. Uh, so I hope it turns up. Live to Fly, are you saying that Alfred Alfred Music maybe did carry it at one time and now they're not? Because I think of it as a Hal Leonard thing. Well, I mean, Hal Leonard did it at one time. Um, I see. Okay. Something to think about. Just goes to show, if you see a book that, that turns you on, grab it, because nothing lasts forever. Um, you might as well just grab it. Okay, my friends. So let's see. I, uh, I know it's just about time to wrap up. eBay has one. Uh, okay, it has one. Um, okay, interesting about Alfred. So maybe at one point Alfred had the rights to it, and then, you know, they let it run its course. But it's one of those books that, like, it has to exist because it's such a cool collection. In my mind, it's like, there has to be at least one book like that out there in the, in the universe. Steven said, I would love to see you plug in some night. Let me tell you the number one reason I'm not plugging in. Here in uh, this Elm Street studio, uh, I have to run over here, um, so to speak, um, with all this equipment. Um, and to to bring a guitar amplifier, I, I don't mind bringing an electric guitar, but to bring a guitar amplifier, it's just, uh, it's just one more thing. Um, when, <laughs> when my corner of Main Street gets the upgraded internet service that we are promised soon. I'll be doing the live streams back at my music shop um, and all my equipment is right there and I won't have to hustle over here with all this stuff. Uh, um, but yeah, but I, I, I'm totally open minded to bring the electric car. I'm not saying I'll never bring it, um, but it's just tricky hustling over here with this equipment. Uh, I love it. Don't get me wrong, because hey, we had a uninterrupted live stream. Look at this. No, no problems. What could possibly go wrong in the next five minutes? Uh, um, so, so yeah. So someday we'll do that. I'll, I'll, um, hey, maybe we'll do a thing where I'm not just some dude playing electric guitar, but I will maybe like walk you through some electric guitar related stuff. Stuff that would make sense. Yeah, that's a great. Great idea. Uh, um, Bruce Lindquist. Joseph is mentioning Bruce Lindquist as a guy who does all those types of spy songs. I have not heard of him. The Munsters, Goldfinger, all that stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, Bruce Lindquist. So why, let's all check him out and see what's going on. Live to Fly. You don't think I could jinx myself, do you? By saying what a great live stream we've had with no interruptions. Nothing could go wrong. I mean, why would anything go wrong? No. Yeah, Joseph, I will check him out. Bruce Lindquist. Um, I love hearing you guys um, mention new folks. There's, there's no lack of talented people out there, right? Um, and for everyone you find out about, you know, I have a feeling there's 10 more out there, you know. Um, and that's great, you know. And everyone's so different. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, my friends, I think, I think we did what we set out to do tonight. I think uh, we can call it here. Um, poll results, 64% are have the goal of being a strummer, 36% have the goal of being a total pro, and I realize that we all 
you know, I, I made you guys choose, but I think um, probably almost all of us would love to have a balance between those two things. I get it. But thanks for uh, thanks for picking a side and, you know, something fun for us to talk about and think about. All right, my friends, don't forget, I put the I put my email address in the chat. I'm going to do it one more time. Um, and I'll put it in the description of the uh, of the video as well. Info at song dash bike dot com. Uh, because some of you may think of um, song requests for the chord melody book. Uh, you might think of them tomorrow or the next day. Just send me an email. Um, oh, you know, maybe in the email put um, chord melody suggestion or chord melody song or something like that. Chord melody request, something like that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, that'll get my attention. Um, so, all right, you guys. I think we're good. Uh, next Saturday, February 10th, as far as I know, I'll be right here. Broadcasting from the Connecticut River Valley Delta. And uh, thanks for the great questions. Thanks for taking part in the poll. Thanks for, uh, you know, salty dog. Great folk tune. Um, all right, you guys. So have a great uh, Saturday. Have a great Sunday. Uh, take care of yourself. Hope you have some good quality guitar time during the week. I will see you guys next Saturday, don't forget to follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Um, that's how I can keep you guys posted. For instance, if I have to start late, if I have to cancel out on you, I would feel terrible if you guys didn't get that message. I don't foresee that happening anytime soon, but head over to Facebook or Instagram, song, bike, S-O-N-G-B-I-K-E, all one word. My smiling face will probably show up. Um, and, uh, and just follow me on social media, and that's how we can all stay in touch. All right, you guys. Until next time, uh, be well, and I'll see you next Saturday night. All right. Bye, guys.